Adventures in American Literature, William Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. William Bradford, from 1590 to 1657. In his upbringing and his devotion to God, William Bradford typified most of the first settlers of New England. The son of an English farmer, he began to read the Bible seriously at the age of 12. While still a boy, he joined with a group of Puritans for prayer and religious discussion. The act took courage for members of Bradford's family urged against it, and Puritans in England were often, in Bradford's words, taken and clapped up in prison, or had their houses beset and watched night and day. Such hounding by authorities led many Puritans to flee to Holland. Bradford was among them. Uneasy in Holland as well, he and some other Puritans decided to come to America. Bradford's life in America began tragically, and in this, too, he typified many of the first settlers. With about a hundred other English immigrants, Bradford reached Plymouth, Massachusetts in December 1620 aboard the Mayflower, a tiny ship with a cracked beam that barely weathered the crossing. While the ship stood in Cape Cod Harbor, considering where to land, Bradford's wife fell or jumped overboard and drowned. Many of those who landed were no luckier. In their first fierce winter ashore in America, about half of them died. If Bradford's experience was typical, it was also in two ways special. He became the governor of Plymouth, and he wrote its history. In their yearly voting, the settlers elected and re-elected him governor some 30 times. In 1630, he wrote down his recollections of the founding of Plymouth and began keeping a record of annual events in the settlement, a practice he continued until 1647. His manuscript, containing about 270 pages, was consulted by other Puritan historians, but it stayed unpublished for 200 years, during which time it somehow made its back, its way back to England. Bradford's work of Plymouth Plantation, published for the first time in 1856 as History of Plymouth Plantation, is pervaded by an enduring vision of America as a nation dedicated to and sustained by God. The book also relates some of the best remembered episodes in American history. It describes the Puritans' flight from England to Holland, where, fearing the corruption of their children by foreign customs, they plan their desperate second remove to America. It tells of such trials as the terrible first winter in the hideous and desolate wilderness, full of wild beasts and wild men. The Indians themselves appear often in Bradford's history, Samoset and Squanto, who not only tell the pilgrims about the surrounding country, but also do so to the pilgrims' astonishment in English. See page 30. The Bloody Pico War climax by the killing of about 600 Indian men, women, and children during the deliberate burning of their village, a fearful sight, Bradford wrote, to see them thus frying in the fire and the streams of blood quenching the same. Begun in tragedy, Bradford's life in America closed in disappointment. As his book nears the end of its story of the 25-year effort to settle Plymouth, its tone grows mournful. Having fled a corrupt Europe, the settlers themselves began to commit crimes and live immorally. Having survived the wilderness, war with the Indians, and financial exploitation by profiteers in England, many of the settlers began moving away from Plymouth. To Bradford, the place seemed like an ancient mother grown old and forsaken of her children. In his disappointment, Bradford once again proves typical. He would not be the last American writer to feel that the divinely uh, guided nation had fallen short of its promise. From Of Plymouth Plantation, of their voyage and how they passed the sea, and of their safe arrival at Cape Cod. September 6th. 
these troubles being blown over and now all being compact together in one ship, they put to sea again with a prosperous wind, which continued divers days together, which was some encouragement unto them, and yet, according to the unusual according to the usual manner, many were afflicted with sea sickness. And I may not omit here a special work of God's providence. There was a proud and very profane young man, one of the seamen of a lusty able body, which made him the more haughty. He would always be contemning the poor people in their sickness and cursing them daily with grievous execrations and did not let to tell them that he hoped to cast half of them overboard before they came to their journey's end. And to make merry with what they had, and, if he were by any gently reproved, he would curse and swear most bitterly. But it pleased God before they came half seas over to smite this young man with a grievous disease of which he died in a desperate manner, and so was himself the first that was thrown overboard. Thus his curses light on his own head, and it was an astonishment to all his fellows, for they noted it to be the just hand of God upon him. After they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with cross winds, and met with many fierce storms, which with the ship was shroudly shaken, and her upper works made very leaky and one of the main beams in the midships was bowed uh, bowed and cracked which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage so some of the chief of the company perceiving the mariners to fear the sufficiency of the ship as appeared by their mutterings they entered into serious consultation with the master and other officers of the ship to consider in time of the danger and rather to return rather to return than to cast themselves into a desperate and inevitable peril and truly there was great distraction and difference of opinion amongst the mariners themselves fain would they do what could be done for their wages sake being now near half the seas over and on the other hand they were loath to hazard their lives too desperately but in examining of all opinions the master and others affirmed they knew the ship to be strong and firm under water and for the buckling of the main beam there was a great iron screw the passengers brought out of holland which would raise the beam into its place the which being done the carpenter and master affirmed that with the post put under it set firm in the lower deck and other ways other ways bound, he would make it sufficient. And as for the decks and upper works, they would caulk them as well as they could, and though, with the working of this ship, they would not long keep staunch, yet there would otherwise be no great danger, if they did not overpress her with sails. So they committed themselves to the will of God and resolved to proceed. In sundry of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the seas so high as they could not bear a knot of sail but were forced to hull for divers days together and in one of them as they thus lay at hull in a mighty storm a lusty young man called john howland coming upon some occasion above the gratings was with a seal of the ship thrown into the sea but it pleased God that he caught hold of the topsail halyards, which hung overboard, and ran out at length. Yet he held his hold, though he was sundry fathoms under water, till he was hauled up by the same rope to the brim of the water, and then with the boat, hook, and other means got into the ship again, and his life saved. And though he was something ill with it, yet he lived many years after and became a profitable member both in church and commonwealth in all this voyage there died but one of the passengers which was william button a youth servant to samuel fuller when they drew near the coast but to omit other things that i may be brief after a long beating at sea they fell with that land which is called cape cod the which being made and certainly known to be it, they were not a little joyful. 
after some deliberation had amongst themselves with the master of the ship, they tacked about and resolved to stand for the southern, the wind and weather being fair, to find some place about Hudson's River for their habit uh, habitation. But after they had sailed that course about half the day, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers, and they were so far entangled therewith as they conceived themselves in great danger, and the wind shrinking upon them withal, they resolved to bear up again for the cape and thought themselves happy to get out of those dangers before night overtook them. And as by God's good providence, they did. And the next day they got into the Cape Harbor where they rid in safety. Being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought to safe land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. But here I cannot stay and make a pause and stand half amazed at this poor people's present condition. And so I think will the reader too, when he well considers the same. Being thus past the vast ocean and a sea of troubles before in their preparation, as may be remembered by that which went before, they had now no friends to welcome them, nor inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies, no houses or much less towns to repair to, to seek for succor. It is recorded in scripture as a mercy to the apostle and his shipwrecked company that the barbarians showed them no small kindness in refreshing them. But these savage barbarians, when they met with them, as after will appear, were readier to fill their sides full of arrows than otherwise. And for this season it was winter, and they that know the winters of that country know them to be sharp and violent and subject to cruel and fierce storms, dangerous to travel to known places, much more to search an unknown coast. Besides, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness, full of wild beasts and wild men, and what multitudes there might be of them they knew not? Neither could they, as it were, go up to the top of Pisgah to view from this wilderness a more goodly country to feed their hopes, for which way soever they turn their eyes save upward to the heavens they could have little solace or content in respect of any outward objects for summer being done all things stand upon them in with a weather-beaten face and the whole country full of woods and thickets represented a wild and savage hue if they looked behind them there was the mighty ocean which they had passed and was now a main bar and gulf to separate them from all the civil parts of the world if it be said that they had a ship to succor them it is true but what heard they daily from the master and company but that with speed they should look out a place with their shallop where they would be at some near distance, for the season was such as he would not stir from thence till a safe harbor was discovered by them where they would be, and he might go without danger, and that victuals consumed a pace, but he must and would keep sufficient for themselves and their return. Yea, it was muttered by some that if they got not a place in time, they would turn them and their goods ashore and leave them. Let it also be considered what weak hopes of supply and succor they left behind them, that they might bear up their minds in this sad condition and trials they were under, and they could not but be very small. It is true indeed, the affectations and love or the affections and love of their brethren at Leyden was cordial and entire towards them but they had little power to help them or themselves and how the case stood between them and the merchants and their coming away hath already been declared what could now sustain them but the spirit of god and his grace may not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say 
our fathers were Englishmen, which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness. But they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity, etc. Let them therefore praise the Lord, because he is good, and his mercies endure forever. Yea, let them which have been redeemed of the Lord show how he hath delivered them from the hand of the oppressor. When they wandered in the desert wilderness out of the way and found no city to dwell in, both hungry and thirsty, their soul was overwhelmed in them. Let them confess before the Lord his loving kindness and his wonderful works before the sons of men. The Starving Time but that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months' time, half of their company died, especially in January and February, being the depth of winter and wanting houses and other comforts, being infected with the scurvy and other diseases, which this long voyage and their in accommodate, uh, in accommodate condition had brought upon them. So as there died sometimes two or three a day in the foresaid time, that one of that one hundred and odd persons, scarce fifty remained. And of these, in the time of most distress, there was but six or seven sound persons who to their great commendations, be it spoken, spared no pains, night nor day, but with abundance of toil and hazard of their own health, fetched them wood, made them fires, dressed them meat, made their beds, washed their loathsome clothes, clothed and unclothed them. In a word, did all the homely and necessary offices for them, which dainty and queasy stomachs cannot endure to hear named, and all this willingly and cheerfully, without any grudging in the least, showing herein their true love unto their friends and brethren, a rare example and worthy to be remembered. Two of these seven were Mr. William Brewster, their reverend elder, and Miles Standish, their captain and military commander, unto whom myself and many others were much beholden in our low and sick condition. And yet the Lord so upheld these persons as in this general calamity, they were not at all infected either with sickness or lameness. And what I have said of these, I may say of many others who died in this general visitation, and others yet living, that whilst they had health, yea, or any strength continuing, they were not wanting to any that had need of them. And I doubt not, but their recompense is with the Lord. But I may not here pass by another remarkable passage not to be forgotten. As this calamity fell upon, uh, fell among the passengers that were to be left here to plant and were hasted ashore and made to drink water that the seamen might have the more beer and one in his sickness desiring but a small can of beer, it was answered that if he were their own father, he should have none. The disease began to fall amongst them also, so as almost half of their company died before they went away, and many of their officers and lustiest men, as the boat swain gunner, three quartermasters, the cook, and others, at which the master was something struck in and sent to the sick ashore and told the governor that he should send for beer for them that had need of it, though he drunk water homeward bound. But now amongst his company there was far another kind of carriage in this misery than among the passengers, for they that before had been boon companions in drinking and jollity in their time of their health and welfare began now to desert one another in this calamity, saying they would not hazard their lives for them. 
they should be infected by coming to help them in their cabins. And so after they came to lie by it, would do little or nothing for them. But if they died, let them die. But such of the passengers as were yet aboard showed them what mercy they could, which made some of their hearts relent as the boatswain and some others, who was a proud young man and would often curse and scoff at the passengers. But when he grew weak, they had compassion on him and helped him. And then he confessed he did not deserve it at their hands. He had abused them in word and deed. Oh, saith he, you, I now see, show your love like Christians indeed one to another, but we let one another lie and die like dogs. Another lay cursing his wife, saying if it had not been for her, he had never come this unlucky voyage, and anon cursing his fellows, saying he had done this and that for some of them, he had spent so much and so much amongst them, and they were now weary of him and did not help him having need. Another gave his companion all he had, if he died, to help him in his weakness. He went and got a little spice and made him a mess of meat once or twice. And because he died not so soon as he expected, he went amongst his fellows and swore the rogue would cousin him he would see him choked before he had made him any more meat, and yet the poor fellow died before morning. Indian Relations All this while the Indians came skulking about them, and would sometimes show themselves aloof off, but when any approached near them, they would run away, and once they stole away their tools where they had been at work and were gone to dinner, but about the 16th of March, a certain Indian came boldly amongst them and spoke to them in broken English, which they could well understand, but marveled at it. At length, they understood by discourse with him that he was not of these parts, but belonged to the eastern parts where some English ships came to fish with whom he was acquainted and could name sundry of them by their names, amongst whom he had got his language. He became profitable to them in acquainting them with many things concerning the state of the country in the east parts where he lived, which was afterwards profitable unto them, as also of the people here, of their names, number, and strength, of their situation and distance from this place, and who was chief amongst them. His name was Samoset. He told them also of another Indian, whose name was Squanto, a native of this place, who had been in England, and who could better speak English than himself. Being after some time of entertainment and gifts dismissed, a while after he came again, and five more with him, and they went and they brought again all the tools that were stolen away before and made way for the coming of their great sachem called Masoit, who about four or five days later came with the chief of his friends and other, other attendants with the aforesaid Squanto, with whom, after friendly entertainment and some gifts given him, they made a peace with him which hath now continued this twenty-four years in these terms. Number one, that neither he nor any of his people should injure or do hurt to any of their people. Number two, that if any of his did hurt to any of theirs, he should send the offender that they might punish him. Number three, that if anything were taken away from any of theirs, he should cause it to be restored and they should do the like to his. Number four, if any did unjustly war against him, they would aid him. If any did war against them, he should aid them. Number five, he should send to his neighbors confederates to certify them of this, that they might not wrong them, but might be likewise compromised in the conditions of peace. Number six, that when their men came to them, they should leave their bow and arrows behind them. 
after these things he returned to his place called Soams, some forty miles from this place. But Squanto continued with them, and was their interpreter, and was a special instrument sent of God for their good beyond their expectation. He directed them how to set their corn, where to take fish, and to procure other commodities, and was also their pilot to bring them to unknown places for their profit, and never left them till he died.